Good afternoon, everyone. I am here with Liz Brandt, the CEO and co-founder of Control Shift, a business innovation consultancy that specializes in the strategic value of trusted personal data. Before we begin, the Support Center Data Sharing is helping to organize this interview and is the platform you're most likely finding this on. The SCDS is an EU initiative that focuses on researching, documenting, and reporting on data sharing practices, EU legal frameworks, and the different access and distribution technologies that are relevant to organizations and businesses. The SCDS aims to raise awareness among businesses, public bodies, academia, and citizens about the benefits, challenges, and possibilities of data sharing. In addition, we aim to learn from stakeholders about why they are sharing data in the first place, what inspired them, how are they doing it, what kind of legal arrangements and technical mechanisms were selected and why, as well as what the potential economic benefits of sharing data for the actors involved are. So, in this interview, we will briefly discuss and touch upon the background of Control Shift, what inspired it, what the consultancy does, and why you got involved with data sharing work and research what kind of data sharing models you explored in your research, the legal frameworks you worked with and looked at, what technical aspects you touched upon as well, and ending with what's next for control shift and the world of data sharing. Off to you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you very much for the interview. It's very exciting to be here. So do you want me to kick off with what is control shift? Yes, please. Great. So, as you say, we're a consultancy that focuses on uh, innovation with data and sustainable use of personal data to create value. And um, we've been in market for 10 years. And I have to say, 10 years ago when we set up, it wasn't the most popular thing we could do. Um, many companies were quite confused about why they would share any data about anything, because data is actually something they should keep. Um, but we, uh, look, we understood and we had a hypothesis that the data that we would all create as we went through the next few years would become not just more, but more personal. And when you get more personal, you have to have a different type of information sharing relationship, one where it's not just owned by the organization, but used and shared with and for the individual's benefit. And indeed, not just the individual, but society as well. We believe, and we had a hypothesis 10 years ago, that it, data can benefit business, society, and individuals. And what we found over 10 years is that we're, we were right, which is great. Um, so, so 10 years ago, we did a lot of work with strategists in organizations like banks and telecommunications companies. But we also worked with the World Economic Forum on new data practices, and we work with governments and regulators around the world. So we were working on what does it actually mean for society? What does it mean for business? What does it mean for individuals? And in fact, uh, we're business advisors to the UK government on the My Data programme, which was uh, preceding GDPR, looking at how individuals can have access to their data and what the value is that could be created from that. So we started out uh, looking at the market as a market analyst and consultancy business and uh, very quickly realized that people didn't want market analysis about a market that didn't exist. So we have become consultants um, and we are now consulting with businesses around the world on what the new business models are, what the new value opportunities are how to create value and how to sustain that in your business. So how to create new propositions with new business models, how to create new personalized service, how to create uh, the governance and principles and policies inside your business to make that sustainable. And, that, and that's our main focus. But we also do market making work, which is ostensibly working on the market itself to enable the market models to evolve. And, and that's really where our work in the data sharing, in, in the most recent work in data sharing came from, because we worked with the UK government last year on uh, understanding how data portability can create new economic growth um, and societal and, and more sustainable societies. Um, and you can find on our website um, the report from last year, which uh, looked at three different angles. One is what is the economic and societal benefit from a, 
an economist's perspective. So we had a group of economists in our team. We also looked at what the, um, the challenges are and we, we were quite surprised after 10 years to find that we didn't quite understand all the challenges that this, would, this data sharing approach would take. So looking at uh, data portability, which is the right in GDPR for uh, data sharing with the individual. So it gives the individual the right to access data in a machine readable portable form that's license free. So in other words, you don't pay for it. Um, how do we make that into an economic opportunity? Um, and what we found is actually we need to overcome a number of challenges which once we've understood them are not actually insurmountable at all but they do they do add up to a fair number of things that need to be coordinated across what we see as five core issues and, and the core issues if we start from infrastructure and standards and then come back to infrastructure and standards i'll talk a bit to those core issues so infrastructure and standards are definitely a core issue. They involve things like interoperability, liability models, third party data sharing. But again, if I come back to those, I think that would be most useful. Without infrastructure and standards, we don't have a way of effectively sharing data and making it um, easy and risk free. Uh, but additionally, it, there's an issue, a core issue around consumer know-how. So while consumers don't understand anything about the data economy or much about the data economy, they can put themselves and others at risk, other people and other organisations. When we did our work for the UK government, we interviewed 50 experts around the world and we reviewed 100 projects uh, from around the world um, and papers from around the world. So drawing on that, we identified that a lot of people are very concerned about the risks that consumer, low consumer know-how creates. And if I explain that from one stance, we have open banking in the UK and the concern from the banks is that you share the data with, Liz asks for the data, you share the data with Liz, Liz then passes it to somebody else and that somebody else does something nefarious with it, something bad with it and then empties Liz's bank account and or sets up false identities, set takes out mortgages, sets up some sort of betting ring, all sorts of things you can do with that data that's not actually in the interest of Liz. And that was done completely um, uh, with, without sort of understanding of the risks that the individual is taking because most people don't understand what's going on. Um, I think in the UK, there was a piece of research by a company called Dot Everyone which said that 76% of people don't understand Google's business model. If you don't understand Google's business model, you won't understand Joe Shady's business model either about what they're going to do with your data and how they're going to disappear with it, what they're going to do that isn't in your interest. So that, that is a risk to the individual, but additionally it's in, at a risk for the organization because not yet, we don't yet have a liability model that, un, that, that recognizes data sharing. So if, Liz, if I share that data, whose responsibility is it if my bank account is emptied or my identity is, is um, stolen? And nobody really knows what that is yet. And that's still a blank space, even in things like open banking. So we need to understand liability. Once we can understand liability, we can start to sort out whether the consumer has responsibility, and if so, what that responsibility is and or whether other organizations have responsibility. And once we understand what responsibility we have, we can start to actually manage the risk either through insurance policies or through technology or through new policies and principles for the market. So that just, uh, th those kind of core problems and issues come back up in infrastructure, but that is recognized also in consumer know-how. So once we understand that, then we can understand how the consumer can operate safely in the market. Additionally, we need new services that use that shared data to create value for me. So why would I move my data if I can't give it to something that's useful? Um, and there are a lot of those services already in market, but they're completely starved of the assets they need to make that valuable. So they can't get the data to make that valuable. And if you look at services that, for instance, help me with my mental health, 
they can't get to my data, which is my things that trigger poor mental health, financial instability, um, poor diet, poor exercise, relationships. So if they can't get to the data about my bank account, they can't get to my data about my exercise, they can't get to my data about my social interactions or my other relationships, they can't get to my data about media consumption. All of these things have an in indicator for my mental health. So if we can get to that data, we can start to deliver new services that create a completely new value for people so that they can start to recognize things that are happening in their lives and better manage them. But those services that are out there at the moment, they can't get to the data. And they can't get to the data because there's, there's, a very, there's no business case really at the moment for businesses to share that data. The people who already have that data make a lot of money out of that data for themselves and for their consumers, but also for the rest of society. And there's no business case for sharing that with others. Part of that is because there's no liability model, so you can't work out what the risks are. Part of it is because there's no infrastructure to make it safe. Part of it is because there's no services that make it valuable. And part of it is because consumers don't understand. So we've got this Gordian knot, this, this complicated in, in, interreaction between the challenges as to why people may or may not share data. Additionally, people are very concerned that regulation has not yet caught up with what's going on and that regulation will come down hard and will actually cause the market to uh, falter rather than enable it. So they're very worried that it will stifle growth rather than enable growth. So there is a, there's, a, there's an inherent need for regulators to be uh, adaptive about how they are approaching this market, learn by working with organizations, which again creates a completely new set of relationships because governments and organizations tend not to collaborate too much and tend to have quite an antagonistic relationship. So trying to pull together those new relationships is quite critical, which takes us all the way back to infrastructure really, because infrastructure we see as, as core to making this market safe and easy. Um, and safe and easy markets enable us to create value. So a safe market enables the secure savings, sharing of data. Um, and that's a sh sharing from the organization that already holds it. In a GDPR data portability enabled world where the individual can ask for that data, to then be onward shared with another organization. So how do we make that, that sharing safe? How do we also make it privacy enabled? So, and, and how do we make that, um, that market model work so that consumers can be protected against the parties uh, misusing that data and or the data being uh, used and abused um, and, and problems for them and their suppliers? coming into play. So we've got things, as I've already mentioned, liability models, third party data sharing, interoperability and standards around data sharing are absolutely critical. So what's the standard of the data? What's the standard of the sharing of data? How does that data actually get shared? Is it a live feed? Is it a download of data? How does that data get, that, that data get shared? There's a number of, of infrastructural requirements in, in not just technology, but in our society about how that data is actually shared. So that's what we discovered when we did our work for government last year. Um, and as I say, it's difficult, but it's not insurmountable. And what we know is there's a lot of that already in market. So we set out to work with organizations to discover what's already there and what gaps remain. That was a very, very thorough um, introduction to control shift. Thank you very much for that. There are several points that you discussed that I wanted to um, elaborate on. One of them being that you mentioned that there are a lot of organizations or a lot of people would benefit if some data was shared, for example, the data is around mental health or the financial relationships, what you do in social media. And you mentioned that um, they can't get access to that and there's a lot of fears behind it, whether it be the legal standards, GDPR, and the fact that it's their personal and private data being shared. How do you see, in your research, did you see a way to overcome this difficulty or this challenge? The challenge of uh, securely sharing? 
of securely sharing and also to appease people that um, their private data is being shared? Okay, so uh, our, our hypothesis and our vision for that is that the individual needs some transparency and some control over the data mm -hmm. to enable the individual to feel comfortable then what's being done is being done on their behalf. So not just transparency actually in control, but somebody, an entity, which acts on their behalf and advocates for the individual. So there, there is something else in this market, which is there aren't going to be very many people who are going to actively go and get their data and share it. And I have a little mantra, which is people will not do more work. And at the moment, people spend a maximum of three minutes a week managing their finances. So I can't honestly imagine them spending more or even that much managing their data. So we've got to make it, make it possible for them to share it in a way that's labour free as much as possible, safe and, and is on their behalf. So we, we have a hypothesis that there is, an, there is an entity in the market that advocates on behalf of the individual acts on their behalf, under their control, to actually make that data flow. And you'd sort of analogize it to a bank account, really. So you don't have to look at your bank all the time to make sure your direct debits are going or your standing orders are going, but you can actually control that. So you, you can actually sign up to money going to somewhere on a regular basis, or you can sign up to it going once, or you can sign up to it so that you can stop it whenever you want it to stop. And, and that's, the sort of thing we see in market that enables the individual to feel comfortable. That also means that we get the legal entities um, that can actually manage and, and carry the liability for different parts of the market model. So on one hand, the entity that's making the data available, on another hand, the entity that's acting on behalf of the individual, and on the other hand, the entity that's going to use the data. And then we can start to work out who is responsible, who provides the technical capability, who provides the privacy enabled capability, who provides the value. And then you can start to work out what the business models are that we've got underneath. So that, that, that facilitates what we've called, it variously gets called all sorts of things, but in our experiment, we ended up calling it a data facilitator because we think it's sort of a generic form they facilitate the data on behalf of the individual. They've sometimes been called personal data stores, personal data lockers. So they're, they're called many, many things. And, and there are a lot of them in market, um, but they, they still haven't found their particular niche because there's, the data isn't really available for sharing. So we see that as, as, the, as a core part of enabling individuals to feel more comfortable and enabling the, the legal frameworks to, to fall into place in our society. Okay, and you mentioned already looking at different uh, models in your research. What data sharing models did you investigate or have you already touched upon? Well, we, we investigated one particular model, um, which actually is the model where the data moves from what we call the exporting organization, mostly an incumbent then through to a data facilitator and then out to uh, an importer. We did some research uh, for the, as I've mentioned, for the UK government. We then went on to run a, a what we're calling a data mobility sandbox. And maybe first of all, explain data mobility as the model and then the actual sharing model that we used in that sandbox. So data mobility is what we see as the market model that wraps around data portability that overcomes the challenges that I've mentioned. So it starts to implement the infrastructure. It, it helps individuals understand what they should or shouldn't do in the way that it's actually, the, the way the user experience works. It, it includes the business models and the regulatory frameworks. So, the, the market model being data mobility, we then ran a sandbox earlier this year, which experiments with data mobility. So what we actually did was we took one particular data sharing model within that data mobility sandbox, where the data goes from exporters to the data facilitator that I mentioned earlier, and then on to importers. So from a, let's say, a bank, 
through to a data facilitator, which in this case was DigiMe, and then out to an app and service that would act on behalf of the individual. Um, and we did that with five different companies. We did it with Barclays being bank, British Telecom being a telecoms company, Centrica being an energy company, BBC being a media company, and Facebook, the social media company. So we took the data from those five organisations on behalf of the individual. Actually, the individual took the data. And we moved it from those exporting organisations through the data facilitator to the service, which would then create the value. And in this instance, it was a, it was a service that helped you to track your social media profile and make that available to other, other companies. So it's a very small app, to be honest with you, but it's the experiment of doing it. And we moved the data, as I say, we've got 22 people we, who then came into a lab and used the service to actually move data out of all those organisations onto, a, uh, onto an app. And we further refined our understanding about what the infrastructure requirements are, what the market model needs to uh, create, but also what the user experience needs to be because when you start bolting multiple companies together the user experience gets a very uh, uncomfortable and what we recognized in that was that the one particular thing we recognized was that the communications between the different organizations to the individual made it very scary so you'd export data from one organization let's say from the bbc and the bbc would say don't take the data it's very dangerous and then you take it to the facilitator and the facilitator would say, well, I don't take responsibility for this. Um, and then you'd pass it on to an app and they say, well, look, you know, I don't take responsibility for your data at all. So everybody's kind of going, I don't have responsibility for this. It's not my problem. Um, and the individual actually then ends up being responsible. So it all points back to the individual. Which, when you're sharing data for something that's about your social media profile, maybe it's not that important. But when you're sharing all of your data, this becomes really important and actually what you end up with then is the individual holding the liability and feeling very uncomfortable about it so we can't you know we can't operate a market when it works like that so we've got to sort out how we communicate whose responsibility is his along with whose work out whose responsibility actually is if something goes wrong i had a question about the name actually how did you come up with personal data mobility sandbox well, because we were, when we were working with the UK government, um, we saw the data portability opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then recognising the challenges, we recognised that there was something that was beyond data portability. So we needed a name that was not data portability, but was recognised as the market model. Um, and it took us quite a while. We went through all sorts of, I think at one point it was called Teapot. <laughs> But it took us quite a while to come up with a different name and data mobility was the name because it makes it mobile, makes the data mobile and accessible in the marketplace and able to deliver value. And we wanted a, we wanted a safe place to experiment, that's why we called it a sandbox. Um, can sandbox, sandpit, whatever you want to call it, it's a safe place to experiment. And maybe I should also mention that that sandbox uh, we had observers from government as well. So we had the information regulator in the UK. We had um, government departments who work on the strategy and implementation of data sharing. We also had Consumers International who are a consumer group. Um, and we had a Southampton University as observers in the sandbox with, a, with an intention of overseeing and making sure that it was safe, but also of feeding back, really importantly, feeding back the findings to those entities so that they could understand more and hopefully draw upon the learnings within the sandbox. And the companies who were involved with this and the organizations, did they come to you asking to be involved in it or did you reach out to them? How were they selected? Well, um, we've worked in the market, as I said earlier, for, for a long time. So we've been 10 years in market. We've worked with all of these companies before. And all of them have, in one way, shape or form, identified that data portability is really important to them moving forward. So we already, they already were bought into the, the, the business need and the market need. Um, we reached out to all of them, although all of them contributed to our work with government. So it was a natural next step from the work with government to move into then working with these organisations who then funded the sandbox. 
So it's a, it's a business funded sandbox with observers from government. Excellent. That will actually answer another question, immediately answer another, my follow up question. Moving towards the more, back towards the more legal questions. In your research um, on the personal data mobility sandbox, what have you observed about the different legal standards? GDPR is, of course, a big topic around especially personal data. Were there any other difficulties going from the exporter to the data facilitator to the app? Okay, so from a legal standard, you're, um, you're right. I mean, we've got GDPR, which is a fantastic right on behalf of the individual, but we need legal structures that then enable that secure movement of data. And because we had DigiMe as a facilitator, they have already spent a huge amount of time and effort and money on creating a legal structure for DigiMe. So we could rely on their legal structure, but we also then had to get bespoke legal contracts with each organization that was participating. So we had to then work with each organization's legal department so that they knew the data wasn't going to be incorrectly used. Again, we, what we've got to do is create standards around how that, that legal contract works so that we can actually make this a much more mobile market, data mobility. And so all of these organizations had a different, or at least they all represented um, the different legal standards framework and they all had some maneuvering room or they could state or they could um, alter it to fit their business model or to fit their legal team. So DigiMe is a facilitator, then I'm a, my understanding is that there's already a legal document that pertains to looking over and making sure that data sharing is legally compliant. But all of the organizations, Barclays, BBC, Facebook, they were the legal standards and frameworks ad adjusted to fit them specifically or was it more or less the same throughout? No, it was more or less the same throughout. I'm not sure that's in its current form. It probably needs more work. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure at a kind of at scale um, approach that will be how it how it works. Let me take that back slightly because obviously you have to have some standard way of legally interacting, but we've still got to develop how that works. So they took the legal framework that DigiMe had created and understood how much risk they were taking in doing that and the liabilities they were taking and integrated that back into their own business. And indeed learned about what it would be to share data using that sort of model. When we, when we move forward in the market, that the legal frameworks around sharing will no doubt develop. And we have to work out standard ways of doing that, a bit like we've done with Open Banking and PSD2, where we've created legal bound legal frameworks for sharing of data. Do you think um, that less or more legal regulations are needed right now from what you have experienced? I think there's a there's a question as to whether it's legal frameworks or whether it's market standards. So is it new law or is it new legal frameworks? And I know that sounds difficult but if we can create some case um, history of how this data can be used safely and then create shared legal uh, documents then I think we can create create the market without having to have new law. Having said that there is a part to play in I think for governments in making this market happen because I think one it's very difficult for this market to happen unless they mandate the data is actually released. Um, and that will take some action on behalf of, of, of governments. I suspect, and a hypothesis is, that as we go through, we'll find new legal requirements that may well need to be embedded into our nationwide laws. But we aren't yet clear of that and we are taking further forward into the next phase of the sandbox um, a deeper understanding of liability third party validation and other legal related aspects against which we can then start to experiment with what needs to be to be handled by government and new law and what can be handled by markets 
Okay, that's a very concise way of handling it. It's a very difficult topic, actually. Mm -hmm. This is also a good um, way to shift to the technical side. A key takeaway that from your report was the end-to-end -end process of personal data sharing can be made safe. That's from a legal perspective and also from a technical perspective. We have the technology, we have the legal agreements and the, and the frameworks already established. Can you elaborate on this though? Because one of the biggest fears or challenges to anybody who wants to share data are these two aspects. The legal technical? Yes, separately. Well, so, I mean, we've already covered the legal, but of course it gets embedded in the technology. And really the way that um, we, we can see this market developing is through the infrastructural technology capabilities that are embedded in things like data facilitator, but will also be embedded in what organizations do. So you might have a data facilitator, but you have to have standard technologies to release the data and standards around the data itself. And then standards around where you take the data and who can do what with data. And when you start to unpick that, you also get into the technologies around tracking the use of data, tracking um, what's happening with data when it's moving through that system. So there's new technologies that we know are in market that enable us to do that. Excellent. And following up to that, did you, while you were working on this, face difficulties with data standards when with the different organizations? I'm assuming that data is, has different formats, there are different standards in how they regulate it and how they share it. Was it difficult to get it coordinated across the different organizations? The answer to that is yes. <laughs> it's a very simple answer, but there's a, there's a longer answer, which is, um, when you, so the, 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 the standard ontology or the standard uh, around the data, which enables that data to then be used is quite a complex thing to do. And with PSD2 and open banking, there's been a lot of time spent on creating what are the standards, what's the standard data and what format does it come out in? And actually a good example of how that doesn't work is something again they did in the UK <clears throat> a little while ago with energy data where they shared it via a QR code on the bill. But they didn't actually manage the standard of the data that arrived. So the data arrived on your bill in a QR code, but it doesn't work with anything that you actually use to scan it because the data is a different form every time you use it. So you, you know, this is just an easy example of how not to make this work. You have to make, you have to decide what data and you have to decide what standard it comes out in. Additionally, though, we see a role for data facilitators in standardizing the data. We think there's a massive role in market for doing that. And indeed, Digi does, does do that. They've got a standard ontology for a number of market sectors like banking, like health. And they're building up that standard ontology, as are other, other companies. Whether or not that will be the way it works or whether the actual organizations will create the standard is a different uh, matter altogether. So, you know, I think whether or not that actually is the way the standards are created um, and then maintained, history tells us that we have to spend a bit more time thinking about it and sharing that. But as we develop, I'm sure we'll actually get services in market that will standardise data. Okay. Moving on to the more general now, you identified, let's see, you identified critical gaps in your research that require coordinated intervention. I think we discussed that quite thoroughly, unless you want to elaborate on how you think these gaps can be filled. Then moving on to a more open question from my side. Realistically, where do you see the state of data sharing in three, five or 10 years from now? Whether it be in the UK, Europe, globally. I think we'll find, and we're already seeing, very serious, very large Fortune 300 type businesses coming to market with data sharing services that will provide the infrastructure that we've talked about that will lay alongside new value propositions. Once those businesses move into market, they will start to create a demand from consumers. And once we actually see that demand from consumers, the market will move quite quickly. So I would expect that next year we'll see big players in market that will actually make market. They will make this market work or make this market happen. 
And that will mean that in two years time, consumers will start to demand something different. And then we will start to see the new business models developing. And I'd anticipate six to eight years for the market to flourish. Now you could say Facebook's taken 13 years to get to here, 13 or 14 years. So I think we're moving faster than that now. Um, and also we've got a lot of the pieces in play already. The data's already made. There's an awful lot of services already out there. So I'd say it's, it's going to be faster than Facebook. And therefore, I would say six to eight years before we get to a fully fledged market. So what do you see being the biggest challenges to data sharing right now? And what do you predict to be the biggest challenges going forward? So the biggest challenges uh, are fivefold. They mm -hmm. fall into five categories. One is infrastructure and standards. The other one is consumer know-how. Then we've got new services that create the value for the individual, that use the data to create the value. Then we've got the business models to get the data out of the businesses in the first place. And then we've got the regulatory standards, the regulation of the market to make it safe and easy for the value to be created. And, and the thing that I think is going to have to move first is the infrastructure. We're going to have to have infrastructure that enables this market to, to uh, be safe and easy. And a bit like any massive market, take any massive market, let's take automotive. We need the infrastructure to make the cars safe and easy to use. Yeah? We need the roads. We need traffic lights and roundabouts. We need, we need the cars to be safe. We need roll bars in the cars to stop us from being crushed when we roll over. We need, we need steering wheels that, that are soft so we don't hurt ourselves if we have an accident. So we need that infrastructure and that infrastructure is a massive market in its own right. Just, you know, imagine the size of the brake market, the spare part market in cars and the road market and the, the fuel market. That's the infrastructure that we need. Now you can imagine a car driving on it. We're going to have loads of those. Those are going to create lots of value. But it's the infrastructure that we've got to really work on over the next three years. And it will go, it'll be patchy and we'll have all sorts of different standards. And you never know, some countries might drive on different sides of the road <laughs> by the time we've finished. But we will have, all have standards and we will all have a way of, of uh, reflecting this back in our society. And then we can actually get more and more and more value out of it. And in a utopian world where companies and organizations had all the resources and all the support at the disposal to get this infrastructure up and going and achieve those five things. How do you see data, share evol data sharing evolving? I would imagine that we will, as I say, I think inf infrastructure will, will be needed, which will need investment, but the people who have invested in that, I think, will, will, be, will flourish. So they will be the people who are the car, car parts manufacturer. They are the people who are taking the oil out of the ground. They are the people who are creating the roads. Uh, and and those, those people are already in play, actually. And, and there's, but there's still opportunity for lots of people. We will see these amazing services that arrive um, that enable us to use the data. And there will be a huge amount of value in those services. And those will, I think, be an evolution for many of the existing big consumer services that are in market, the energy companies, the telcos, that the banks, et cetera, I think they will evolve and new ones will arrive. You know, will it be Facebook or will it be Barclays that will survive? Will it be HSBC? Will it be BNP Paribas? Or will it be Facebook, Google and some others that will arrive? Who knows, but people have to be nimble and they have to really engage in this market to be part of that enormous market moving forward. And what is next for control shift after this personal data mobility sandbox research that was published this year? What can we look out for as your listeners and your supporters? So we have a number of things that we're now uh, just kicking off. So the second phase of the data mobility infrastructure sandbox, looking, as I've mentioned, at the liability, third party data sharing and at the privacy communications. And that will then uh, feed what we're calling a problem solving community. So helping people across the world who are all developing this in all sorts of different ways to collaborate to bring together the things that they have already developed to help this market to work and or are investing in developing and on top of that infrastructure work 
um, we are also developing what we're calling value sandboxes. So focusing on the value that's, that can be created to show how it can be created, actually create new services, but also look at the infrastructure requirements for that to get more detail about what infrastructure is needed to make that value flow. So we're, we're working with, again, uh, businesses from across sector on the infrastructure and organizations who are interested in specific value areas. And those specific value areas for the moment are um, mental health, we talked about earlier on, they're also uh, pers hyper-personalized media in a car. They're also around savings and pensions and around debt management. So those are the ones that we're focusing on right now, but really interested to hear how other people would like to use data and, and work in our value sandboxes to help grow that ecosystem. Oh, that sounds fascinating. Do you have any hints on when you might publish those reports or have those findings? Well, so the next phase of the infrastructure sandbox kicks off in October and we'll have inter interim results from that. So plan to publish once a month mm -hmm. onto our uh, website. What we're also planning to do is to develop out this community, as I mentioned. We're going to create a model for enabling that to work effectively and then gain funding for that model. So we're looking for funding for the model to share that knowledge and enable people to network. Um, to, to bring that, that knowledge together. And through that network and that, that uh, problem solving community, we will also be communicating what we're finding as far as our sandboxes are concerned. So the first one we can expect November this year, roughly. Yeah, roughly, exactly. Now, if I was government, I would say it's sort of in the autumn winter. <laughs> We don't need to be that politically correct right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else that you want to touch upon around data sharing, around control shift, or anything you want to elaborate on, or anything you feel that we've missed? No, I don't think so. I mean, maybe, maybe I should say, you know, what, what we do as a business is we help businesses grow sustainable value from the use of personal data. We help them with enabling um, the personalization of services, hyper-personalization of services, the creation of wholly new value out of data, and also the governance and policies and principles for managing data so it is sustainable. That's our main job. The work in our sandboxes is market making work. We know this work needs to be done with huge amounts of experience, so we're helping market make. And anybody that wants to come and join in, I would really happily hear from them. Excellent. And what would you say to people or companies listening to this that are hesitant to share data? Well, I'm going to hesitate on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say you're right to hesitate on not sharing data because it still needs infrastructure to make it safe and easy to use. However, I would also say start experimenting and start experimenting in safe environments because I think it's going to move very quickly. The, uh, the, there is an inevitable set of drivers for this market, which isn't about technology and it's not about data. It's about how our society work. It's about how we overcome divisions in our societies. We help vulnerable people in our societies, how we use data to help overcome some of those things, how we use data to create wholly new value which can overcome all sorts of diminishing margins in existing mar markets, how we help regulate and design our world so that we are, that, that it's fair and value can flow. So there's a, there's behind that, there's so many drivers across our world that's going to make this inevitable. We have to start experimenting now. Thank you for those inspirational words and motivational um, message, that motivational message to get people to share data. For those interested, have a look at Control Shift and read their personal data mobility sandbox research. It was published on June 2019 this year. And for other initiatives, look at the Support Center for Data Sharing. Thank you very much, Liz, for your time. Thank you very much, and um, I hope to speak to you soon. Yes, bye. Bye.